for some of you, this is your first slide show. A special welcome to our newer students or anybody who's here for the first time or even if it's just your first time here. So it's great to see you all here. I want to do our usual housekeeping. This may be with some of you, brothers of you, you can do it too, yeah. But I want to thank our new head chef, Rachel. Sweatshirt, black, <laughs> not for acknowledging me in any way, but she made this delicious meal from scratch with the help of our student crew and some other helpers who are here today helping. Thank you all so much for making this meal and getting everything together. It was delicious. So, um, we do have tea in the back. If you want tea, there's hot water over there. There is half and half on this table. It has to start with me, but I will share it so I can go around the room. We do ask that you clean up your own station on your way out. So you can see we have garbage there in the back. Throw your stuff away. Don't leave it here. Throw it away in the garbage. We have a yellow soapy mat over there. It's for your utensils. Um, you can also put your glasses and mugs and stuff on the back table. That just helps our student crew finish up and get out of here on time. Anything else, Rachel? No. Rachel? No. No. Rachel? No. Okay. Chairs. Chairs. And if you want to fold up a folding chair, that would be helpful too. Uh, there's also decaf. Oh, is there decaf? There is decaf coffee on the back table if you want that. So, are there any community announcements today? Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, okay. I'm the new associate coordinator for the Craft Teaching Program, and I was sent here to announce things to you. <laughs> So the first one is that this Friday there will be a public speaking workshop. It's on the third floor in Swift Hall, our nursing home. Um, and Aaron Hollander will lead it and help you all become better public speakers, which is I need right now. So that is for after. Um, the second event is October 14th, Friday, 1.30 to 3.30. It's a it's a Okay, it's on the role of teaching in the academic job market. So if anybody's planning on being on the academic jobs market, um, this is like the closest you'll get to reading the minds of the people who are reading your application. And then... There's <laughs> much formulation this going, sorry. And then uh, October 28th is the Dean Seminar, which is our big event for the quarter. Um, you can RSVP today if you like, and the first 25 people get a free lunch. You can choose from vegan, vegetarian, and uh, meat options. So uh, come to our events, and we hope to see you there later. Thank you. Anyone else? Close the workshop? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Danielle. Uh, I'm a master's student. I also make a lot of coffee because I run a coffee shop. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm also one of the uh, co-coordinators of, uh, of the 101 series in Chicago. Um, so Russell Johnson, our other uh, co-person, just sent out an email that next Tuesday, which is October 4th, uh, starting at 7 p.m., we will be having a 101 on Asatru, which is Old Norse religion. Um, it's being led by Carl Seyfried, who's another master's student here. Uh, it's going to be at the Divinity Disciples House. We will have snacks and drinks. Um, and the one on ones are lectures that are designed for all of us to go learn about something we might not normally take a class in. And also be able to ask like, very introductory and basic questions. So it's not about showing off how much you know, it's just about learning. And yeah, it'll be great. Uh, if you're interested in doing one, though, do let me know. I'll make you talk. Anyone else? Do you quick? Hector, second year busy here. I am um, the co coordinator of the Alternative Epistemologies Club here. Uh, we're going to be sending out our program shortly, but there is, we're starting uh, things off next week uh, with your truly given your presentation. It's going to be late next week, so keep your afternoons free Thursday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, after four. Uh, I'm going to talk about a waiver's disenchantment through a case study that uh, I feel very much uh, connected with, which is a Chupacabra. 
<laughs> so if you're interested in the weird and the alternative, it's just another word for weird. Uh, <laughs> you know, we can show us next week. <laughs> I just want to add quickly, I'm Matt Peterson, I'm one of the representatives of the School for the Graduate Council. Uh, for any new masters or PhD students who are interested, there are a lot of opportunities to get involved with the Grad Council, running various committees or being involved on committees from doing um, funding various events and workshops, doing travel. Um, so it's a cool way to see kind of what's going on in university, what conferences are happening in other divisions, who's flying to a cool place to do Cool research, uh, so if you're interested in maybe checking that out, it's not a very big time commitment. Um, feel free to email me or put me down somewhere. Hi, I'm Jasmine. I'm a new C lifer. Um, my collaborator, Megan Dory, is an alum, alum of this school. We've been working on documenting the Center and Club Bookstore uh, during its move, you know, the old space. So, anyway, um, Many pictures, interviews, essays, and whatnot later. We have published a book, and the release party will be at the bookstore um, on Saturday, October 15th at 4:30. So come and celebrate. Um, thanks. Okay, that seemed like a lot of information. <laughs> Everybody reports all these events to me, and then they come out in one big email at the end of the week. So if you haven't reported your event to me, like Hector, um, you might want to do that. And then you make sure you get my email on Friday. All will be well. So I just want to remind you, we have a reporter's worth on Wednesday lunches. Please come to them all. Please tell everybody else to come to them. They're awesome. And we're going to get started right now with our speaker for the day, who is our dean, Richard Edwards. About the liberty culture. Thank you. <laughs> I will now do my whole life. I'm going to do a Julia. No, no, I'm going to do a Julia. All right, good. Thanks. Let's see here. Okay, that's too quick. Um, so, hang on a second. Sorry, I have a cold, as you can probably tell. Um, I'll try to be clear. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't hear me or if I start to croak, just wave your hand or call 911. Um, so, um, I was grateful when Taryn asked me to talk. I, I guess it represents what's become a kind of a tradition here, uh, which is for deans to open the Wednesday lunch series, both to signal the importance of this as a community event and to have a chance to talk about um, the perspective of someone who has some kind of modicum of responsibility for what happens around here. And um, that's me, I guess. So here I am. Um, the truth about being Dean, in my experience, though, is, is that um, you're really building on people who've gone before you in different ways. Um, when I was Dean from 2000 to 2010, I read heavily and assiduously in Joe Kitagawa and Chris Gamwell and Clark Gilpin's public pronouncements about the school and uh, could be accused of certain kind of, I hope, benevolent plagiarism in the early years of my time as Dean. Um, and that, I think, signals something that might be valuable about deliberative culture, which is my phrase. Um, I picked deliberative culture because I have found myself <laughs> saying on many, many occasions um, over the past six to 12 months, uh, I've been getting vent, as people who know me well do, uh, do know, to my frustration about what I take to be a poor public discourse. And the frustration that goes with it that there is somehow in many formulations of public discourse this assumption that there is somehow a difference between the frustration people feel about deliberation about, say, who should be president of the United States, on the one hand, and deliberation about local issues in one's community on the other. And my sense is that actually the issue of deliberative culture is one of those permeable issues. That's to say that the way we talk about who should be president of the United States is probably much more closely allied than people in the ivory tower are prepared to admit to the way we talk about local issues. Um, and that we ought to think a little bit more reflectively about that relationship. And in that term, specifically about what the role of people in a university setting is in deliberating and developing a deliberative culture. So the talk is really going to be about that. And I'm going to try to model in that a way of thinking about it that seems to me to be at the heart of deliberative culture by bringing together in my extremely clever subtitle 
um, if I may say so. Uh, two things, one of which is my predecessor, Margaret Mitchell's idea of playing with fire as her metaphor for the academic study of religion with James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, the 1963 essay which she published in The New Yorker, which subsequently became a book. And the hope, sorry, um, uh, and the hope, I need to do a turn here. And the hope is that through that process, what I will suggest to you is that engaging in deliberative culture is really a fascinating act of appropriation and re reformulation. And that at the heart of current university, in my judgment, is a kind of fundamental dichotomy that makes that especially hard. And that dichotomy is the dichotomy between, on the one hand, the formulation of the university as a place that is a preserve of knowledge and a place that creates new knowledge. And just to give you an idea of what's at stake here, um, one of the most interesting um, instances of academic leadership in our new century was the short but quite, inter quite uh, dramatic career of Lawrence Summers as president of Harvard. And you'll recall that President Summers, I mean, his academic pedigree is astonishing. Um, he was tenured in the economics department at Harvard University at the age of 25. Um, he was widely regarded as a genius of an economist. Um, that has been ramified out subsequently in things like the fact that almost everyone I know says that Lawrence Summers understood the financial crisis in 2008 before anyone else did, writes about it more clearly and helpfully than anyone else does, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Further interesting thing about Lawrence Summers is that he was very eager to reform Harvard University. And if you talk to people who have been at Harvard for a while, they admire him for it. Um, he thought that faculty should teach undergraduates more than they did. He thought that there should be more integration of the humanities and the sciences, et cetera, et cetera. Lawrence Summers is also notorious for two um, acts of public or semi-public discourse that were regarded as revealing deep insensitivity to the community he was in. And you're probably familiar with at least one of them. Um, the one which gets, as far as I can tell, a little less press is his interaction with Cornell West, um, the public intellectual, for lack of a better word, who was at the time a university professor at Harvard and whom Mr. Summers uh, uh, according to Professor West, berated as someone who was doing things beneath the dignity of his appointment by doing rap videos and the like, and not teaching enough classes. But then the bigger one, of course, was his public statement about women scientists, in which he seemed to imply that the reason that the numbers of scientists who were female uh, was directly related to the capacity of women to do scientific research. So a paradoxical figure and to me, someone who crystallizes in certain ways the problems of the culture of the academy. And where this really came together for me was when I was looking around this summer, because um, I'm a little nervous about these kinds of things, so I've been thinking about this for a while. I came across an editorial that, that uh, Lawrence Summers wrote for the New York Times while he was president of Harvard. And in the editorial, he basically argues the, the following. He says, well, you know, one could think that a research university ought to be a place that devotes itself in a sustained and broad way to the study of languages. And there's a kind of an antiquarian argument for that. But the truth, if you look around, is that eventually we're all going to be speaking English anyway. And so maybe we shouldn't be assuming, in effect, that um, the study of Tamil and Sanskrit and whatnot are, have utility for future intellectual life. Um, and it really struck me when I read that statement that there was this kind of incipient divide between this idea of the university as a kind of preserve for the past and the university that creates new knowledge in which those two things are not at all linked. And the thesis I want to pursue today is that they in fact are. And that while I'm nowhere near as smart as Mr. Summers is, and I certainly didn't get tenure at the age of 25, um, I will respectfully disagree with him and suggest that a real healthy deliberative culture is one which does not divide those things. And I'm going to draw on two people to help me make that claim. One of them is my immediate pre predecessors, the Margaret Mitchell and the other is James Baldwin. So, so far, so good. Um, I'll try to be fast so we can have some time to talk. Now, the first year that Dean Mitchell was here in this capacity, and I guess it would be the fall of 2010, she gave a talk called Playing with Fire at the Task of the Divinity School. 
in which she said the fire with which we play in the Divinity School is talking about religion. Those of you who know Professor Mitchell will know that she can speak in italics more effectively than most people. <laughs> this is not something our culture or our world does very well. There is a lot of fire in the world. Lots of people, sorry about the typo, making claims about their religion, your religion, those crazy people over there's religion, all religious lunatics who defy rationality, etc. She goes on to say, nonetheless, in spite of the fact that we have all this playing with fire going on, there's not much safe playing with fire, not many places where there are stones around the fire or a clearing with some established guidelines. So far as I know, she doesn't camp, but that's another thing. <laughs> a dialogue over the evidence and claims in which the conclusions are not predetermined, places that do not accept violence, bigotry, virulence, or dogmatism as means of argumentation. Not often enough is there a conversation about religion that produces light and heat, but not compulsion, condescension, or condemnation. Okay. I think it would be fair to say that in terms of the lineage of deans of the school, what Dean Mitchell did was to metaphorize a common thread that goes at least as far back, Mr. Brooks will be glad to hear, as Shayla Matthews and Benjamin e. Mays, which is to say that we are about fostering a kind of civic discourse around religion. And what I'm kind of arguing, if I have a humble contribution to make to this, I think the stakes are even larger than that. I think we have to help to create a deliberative culture, not just about religion, but in general terms. And so I want to pursue that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Mitchell goes on to talk about what are the staple elements of playing with fire well, of creating this kind of healthy atmosphere in which the heat and the light of fire is preserved and available, but there's not irresponsible talk, and she talks about philological rigor, she talks about hermeneutical sophistication, and she talks about appreciation for history and tradition. And if you haven't figured it out already, or if you don't know, she's a New Testament scholar. So there we are. Um, okay, James Baldwin. Um, I sort of love this pairing, I have to tell you, for various reasons. Um, so James Baldwin is, I'm going to argue, someone who, in the fire next time, engages in philological rigor has deep hermeneutical sophistication and has a fascinating appreciation for history and tradition. So if we can appropriate the playing with fire metaphor and its pillars towards the notion of a deliberative culture, perhaps Baldwin, who uh, wrote this essay, let's see here, 50, 40, uh, hang on a second, 47 years before he could have had the benefit of Dean Mitchell's thoughts, um, is actually doing something like what she's, what she's advocating in The Fire Next Time. Now, The Fire Next Time consists of two letters, a shorter letter at the start. Actually, how many of you have read this text? Okay. This is really interesting. You all should read this text. Mm -hmm. I know you so cool. This is a very important book. And it's not that long, but you will not be able to read it once and understand it. It's, it's, it's astonishing to me how unwidely read it is, actually, for what it does. Um, but we'll get into that some more. But it consists of two letters, and the first letter is, uh, well, it's the, it's, the, it's the inspiration from Tana E.C. Coates' book, uh, The World and Me. Um, really interesting conversations you can have with people who work in African American studies about Coates and Baldwin, which reveal certain fissures in that field about what does and doesn't count, but we won't go into that today. Um, but the first letter is a letter to his nephew, who's also named James. And I'm going to focus on three passages of that with you today. That's the play that I'm going to have with the fire next time. And then the second letter, a longer letter called Down at the Cross, a letter from a region of my mind, is a rumination in three parts about his engagement with Christianity and with Islam, specifically Elijah Muhammad, and with thinking through his own state in the world vis-a-vis -vis the religious traditions that are available to him. Um, it's really a utilitarian matter that I talk about the first letter and not the second. Um, the second is amazing, but I don't think I have the time to convey what I need to convey about it here. So that's where we are. Okay. Um, the letter to the nephew begins with the phrase, I have begun this letter five times and torn it up five times. And so from the start, we have the sense of something that Baldwin finds difficult to write. Um, this is a hard letter to write. And it's written, he's conscious, on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And it is written in the mode of saying, I need to tell you things, in effect, that I wish I understood when I was younger, but I only understand now. So it's a kind of a classic epistolary form. Um, 
It's a speaker, it's a designated audience, there's a message to be given, and there's the presumption of a kind of possibility for wisdom here that, that matters a great deal. So early in, in the letter to the nephew, Baldwin writes, trust your experience, know whence you came. If you know when you came, there really is no limit to where you can go. The details of your life have been, wow, deliberately, <laughs> deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you. So the problem that Baldwin sets up here is the problem of white construction of the black person. And it's focalized around Baldwin's invocation of what we now refer to as the N-word, in effect. And the degree to which that that focalization and that culture of deliberation, if you will, fixes his nephew in a place in the world. His identity is determined by what he is understood to have been determined by the culture in which he's situated. Okay, so so that's the that's the the, the, res the, the resonance there. Now the book takes its title from a spiritual. And I insert this here because Baldwin will allude to the spirituals later and call them, at the end of the letter, the Homeric poetry of the African American. And the chorus of the spiritual the fire next time is, it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain, you better get ready and bear this in mind, thou showed Noah by the rainbow sign, no more water but the fire next time. Okay. So Baldwin has set up this dichotomy in which what he's basically saying is, in my judgment, look, you live in a culture that tells you who you are. And the question is whether you accept that identification. And the clear and unmistakable rhetoric is that you must not. But the clear and unmistakable question is how might he not? And it seems to me not too big a claim to suggest that one of the reasons the letter was started and torn up five times is not actually the analysis of the situation, it's the answer, right? So it's less that this is the state of affairs and more what shall we do with it. So Baldwin begins, in my judgment at least, in a series of riffs to try to lay out what the nephew ought to do. And he writes, please try to be clear, James. I think I said before the nephew's name, James, also. Through the storm which rages about your youthful head today, about the reality that lies behind the words acceptance and integration. There is no reason for you to try to become <clears throat> like white yo, people, and there is no basis whatever for their impertinent assumption that they must accept you. The really terrible thing, old buddy, is that you must accept them. Okay. And then he goes on, and he says, you come from a long line of great poets, some of the greatest poets since Homer. Now, in my reading, this is unmistakably the tradition of spiritual singing. I don't think it can be anything else myself, although those of you who've read it may, may want to argue with me about that, which is great. One of them said, the very time I thought I was lost, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. You know, and I know that the country is celebrating 100 years of freedom, 100 years too soon. We cannot be free until they are free. God bless you, James, and God speak. That's the way the letter ends. Well, what happened here? Hmm. Hang on. Something. Yeah, just click. Just click. <laughs> Use the arrow. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So then we get what I think is the nub of the first letter. By a terrible law, a terrible paradox, those innocents who believe that your imprisonment made them safe are losing their grasp of reality. But these men are your brothers, your lost younger brothers. And if the word integration, it's the one word he returns to again, the one word he italicizes twice in the letter. If the word integration means anything, this is what it means. That we with love shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are, to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. For this is your home, my friend. Do not be driven from it. 
great men have done great things here and will again. And we can make America what America must become. Hmm. Okay, I'm clearly this up here. Um, okay, an extraordinary transformation seems to me takes place in the letter. From on the one hand, a kind of unmitigating indictment of racism, of the heritage of slavery, to the idea that those people who have been the objects of slavery are the truest Americans and the only source of its salvation. Now, whatever one thinks about the claim Baldwin makes there, and it's worth remembering that subsequent to this, while Baldwin did participate in the civil rights demonstrations in the South in 64 and 65, he subsequently went to Paris and did not live in America for the last 25 or 30 years of his life. It's clear that for him, the, um, the idea that he wants his nephew to take up is the idea that his nephew has a responsibility at one and the same time not to fail to rebuff his past, which means both that he has to name it for what it is and he has to transform it. And that in doing so, what he has to think about is what it means for him to transform the culture in doing so. And in that respect, I want to suggest that Baldwin does engage in philological rigor, hermeneutical uh, sophistication, and appreciation for history and tradition, all those good values that Dean Mitchell allocated, but in a relatively unlikely pace, place, and an unlikely place for us, which I would suggest documents some of the problems we have with deliberative culture today, which is to say our lack of confidence in the relevance of academic work and academic standards, the idea that somehow there is some divide between theory and practice that is so inexorable that the kind of thing Baldwin is advocating is untenable. And I want to suggest that to all of you that to begin to transform the deliberative culture first of our own environment, but then of the university, and then with any luck, more widely, brick by brick, location by location, person by person, we will have to engage in some kind of operation that acknowledges who we are and where we came from, and that puts us in some kind of position of responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the future of all that. It'll have to be a position that doesn't pretend that we are responsible for things we're not responsible for, but that does take responsibility for what we can do. And I think something like that is what Baldwin is about. Now, what does this all have to do with the university in particular, and with uh, the church in particular, as the two institutions that are most commonly identified, or the Moster Synagogue, with students here and faculty here? Well, one thing I would say is that there's a tendency, at least in the academy, for faculty to think about this issue in terms of the classroom and the office. There are specific locations where this work goes on, this work of deliberative culture. It's the way I teach. It's the way I interact with students. I do this sort of thing all the time. I would say if you're an administrator at a university right now, though, that's not the way you think about it. You think about it in terms of trigger warnings and stuff like that. You think about it in terms of public perception and reception. You think about it in terms of donors and supporters and applicants and admitted students and all that stuff. And it seems to me that that's a place where these worlds don't meet internally that impoverish, impoverishes deliberative culture. That if we don't think organically about the whole thing, if we think that I do my part of the job here, they do their part of the job there. The deliberative culture is fractured in some way. Um, the national version of that is, in my judgment at least, and, and you know, this is the closest thing to a paid political announcement you get from me, the open and repeated and unapologetic um, statement of the um, leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, that the goal of the party was to get President Obama out of office. It wasn't to do legislation, in fact. So there's this idea that the branches of government are separate. They do their own work. They don't, they don't conflict together. On campuses, I would say that the suspicion of faculty towards administrators is probably as highly pitched as it's been in my lifetime. And worrisomely to me, the suspicion of faculty on the part of administration is as intense as it's ever been in my lifetime. And I think all this has to do with this kind of bifurcation, in effect. 
And it seems to me it bespeaks an impoverishment of what I'm calling deliberative culture. So, what conclusions can we draw from this before we can stop listening to me and have a conversation, which is much preferable? A couple of things. Uh, one thing is your tradition is there. You have one. James Baldwin and in her way, Margaret Mitchell have underscored that with you and you need to know it. Now, that doesn't mean it's a religious tradition necessarily. Know what Baldwin does with Christianity. Um, the course of the fire next time is the course of a kind of documentation of a separation from his youth and his early Christianity from his own sensibilities. But he cannot discard the tropes of that tradition. He uses them nonetheless. God bless you and God speed. And he doesn't ever think that that tradition isn't there. So I think the first message here is that your tradition in some way marks you, but it doesn't need to be understood to identify you. Your ontological status is not ossified somewhere. You can change, and you should. Um, there's that Dave Matthews line that some of you will know about you know thinking about changing the world while the world changes you, and I think he's got that right. And so I think the first message here is we have to recognize where we come from, who we are, how we're constituted, and if we don't embrace it, at least acknowledge it, and realize that we don't have to embrace it to use it. You know, one of the big gaps today in the academy, I think, is between the study of religion and then the people out in the world who say I'm spiritual but not religious and their inability to talk, and some of that, I think, is, is in this notion that to have a tradition entails certain kinds of determinative identifications that it just didn't for James Baldwin. That's not to say it wasn't a struggle. It's not to say it wasn't difficult for him. But, uh, but Baldwin, you know, Baldwin does his, does his thing there. And that's the hermeneutical sophistication I'm trying to suggest. I want to tack back as well and talk about Baldwin's philological rigor. Um, this is an interesting point to me. So there are a couple of different ways to think about this. Um, one is the way Baldwin writes is fascinating. Uh, the writing is sophisticated and smooth and articulate and funny and scathing. Um, it is not writing that one associates with gospel spiritual traditions. It's not biblical, but it is the, write the writing of an essayist who can hold his own with uh, the people of his day uh, who, who publish essays uh, in you won't know these days, people like Leslie Fiedler, uh, very comfortably, despite a very different heritage. So part of, part of it is that. But the other part of that is, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very influenced by the students I work with. And, and uh, when John Howell, whom you know, was at a class of mine, he made an argument about, about ventriloquism in American literature, and especially about people like, how people like Twain engage in creating voices. Baldwin's creating a voice, and it is some kind of amalgam of Frederick Douglass and Mark Twain, Twain Slate Jim. The kind of combination of this articulate, educated person who has defied the odds and can talk with the learned people with the kind of moral clarity and focus of saying, this is who I am, this is my situation. So there's a kind of hermeneutical sophistication, if you will, in that. And there's an appreciation for the tradition and its history that is reflected, I think, most dramatically in the we are celebrating the emancipation. We are celebrating 100 year, 100 years too early. Something like that constitutes a step towards a really deliberative culture, it seems to me. Um, the other thing I would say is that the second lesson I would learn is that what Baldwin's text and in its way Mitchell's text signals is the complexity of culture and the recognition of complexity in a number of different ways. One is that my identity and past is mine, and I need to sort out what I share and how I can signal what I share from what is unique to me. That's one dimension of the complexity. The other is the range of voices that are available to all of us. We don't have to speak in one way, uh, but we have to think about what it means to speak authentically while using multiple voices. Uh, when I speak to you as dean, I speak to you differently from if you come in my office, differently from when I write an article or a book, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you get the idea on this. Differently when I preach at Rockefeller Chapel. All because at one and the same time, it's still me always, but it's me in a different context with different expectations, with different traditions, right? 
So there's a complexity here that has to be negotiated by all of us. And we won't have a deliberative culture if we don't, uh, because we'll be pretending that we're speaking de novo or that all our circumstances are universal. Um, the last thing I would say is, is a bit of a hobby horse with me, um, but it's probably worth naming. Um, I don't think a deliberative culture is a place that should adopt or encourage any kind of recourse to the notion of what I hear sometimes, which is called best practices, which is this idea, as far as I can tell, that because the Joneses and the Smiths do it, we should do it too. <laughs> now, that's contentious in effect, but in the academy especially, but also I think in religious organizations, there is an enormous centripetal force towards common behavior. Right. Uh, look at the ranking systems for colleges and university. Look at the levers that guide those, and then look at how universities behave in response to them. Look at the churches on issues like sexual equality, and then look at the synods and whatnot, and whatnot, and see the conversations that are repeated again and again in the same kind of way. It's a best practices mentality. It's the idea that this is a problem. There is a way to solve it. And it is, I would submit to you at one time, both a discarding of one specific tradition and a failure of nerve to work with that tradition and to transform it and bring it forward. So to have a truly deliberative culture, in my judgment, is to toss the idea of best practices out the window and think for ourselves. None of which is easy, to say the least. And I'm chastened as I talk to you about this by the fact that Baldwin didn't stay in America. He decided he had to go. Um, and so there clearly are challenges here. And the last thing I want to suggest is that a deliberative culture is something that is easy or something that is locally managed in a comfortable way. But what I can say to all of you is that while the vast majority of you, alas, sadly for us, will leave here to go somewhere else, I can promise you that the issues will be there as well and that the practices that you can cultivate here will hopefully stand you a good step there. So to the degree that I'm capable of use our message, there it is. Anyway, thanks. Wow, I actually did it on time. Questions, comments, disagreements, arguments, please. Yes, Danielle. Bring me a cup of coffee, will you? I gave you two already. You did. Don't tell them that. Uh, thank you. This talk was really interesting, and I appreciate. I haven't. I only read the one of James Baldwin letters, so uh -huh. I appreciate you invoking him because I think he's a fantastic writer, and more people should just be talking about him all the time. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about where you think some of the breakdown between, say, administrators in the academy and faculty happens. Oh, that. I know, yes. Yeah, I, sure. I guess <laughs> as question. students, we most of us, if we didn't come from the University of Chicago, had um, yeah. come from American universities. Yeah. And since we all find ourselves in the humanities, I think we see the breakdown very aggressively in terms of uh -huh. right. universities getting rid of our departments and our majors right. because they don't make money or right. they don't produce majors. And so I'm wondering how we really reinsert ourselves back then into a deliberative culture because it feels like if there is one still, we've been cut out of it. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question, thanks. Um, so I'm going to play the old man for a minute, <laughs> which won't satisfy you, okay? And then I'll try to talk more in a contemporary way. The, the truth is there's a long story of marginalization. And what you're experiencing in the last few years is part of an ongoing discussion. There's a great book by Francis Oakley called The Community of Learning, which is all about higher education. He used to be president of Williams College. And there are these graphs in the back of the number of people who study the humanities in the United States between 1970 and 1990. And it's like 3%, and religion is like 0.4%. I mean, it's just so. So I think one thing to say is that what we have right now, and, and I hope this isn't surface of, of just, not just being an old man to answer your question, is that what we're seeing right now is kind of a culmination of a long trend. And so the answers to this, I think, are not to go back 15 or 20 years and say, well, what do we recoup? Because our recent past isn't a happy one. Um, so, so we have to do some hard thinking about that. Um, 
I would say a couple of things. I almost said something about metrics in relation to best practices because I do think that universities are largely being co-opted by business models in a way that's quite dramatic and that numbers are, as you alluded to, uh, regarded as unambiguous signs of how to assess what's going on. And so I think, I think one of the things to do is to think hard about how one builds a case that's based not on numbers, but kinds of reporting about quality of experience and whatnot, things like that. So on a practical level, I think that matters. On the other hand, um, I, I, you know, I don't know many people who do exactly what they plan to do when they're in college in their lives. I just don't know many. Maybe you guys do, but I don't. Um, I'm certainly not doing what I plan to do, and I can assure you of that. Uh, for a whole host of reasons, um, but uh, but I think that the bottom line is that things are going to change in ways that are going to force a rethinking of this. So, for example, um, to get into the as far as I can tell, to get into the New York News and World Report top ten schools thing, you have to have an enormous number of applications. The dirty little secret is that those are the same ethnic people at every school, right? <laughs> so kids apply to the top 10 schools. So there, we know there are 35,000 kids in the United States who want to go to Harvard, Yale, Chicago, Princeton, blah, 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 okay? So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that there's a whole other world of people who want to work in higher education. And that one way to think about it is that you can go to non elite schools and do great work. That's actually been a wonderful tradition at this place. Um, one of the reasons we have a pretty good place in the record of PhD students is that we don't think they all have to go to Williams or Yale. Um, so I think another answer there is where do you pitch your tent and what do you do? Um, E.S. Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, which was an economics manifesto in the 80s, is I think one of the few books that really takes this idea and presses a little bit, that maybe, maybe the way to go is to think local and build out. In other words, and my presentation can create the idea that we've got to revolutionize the world immediately, and maybe the better thing is to be incremental about it. But I think it's a really good question and a tough one to answer. It's a very tough environment. The other thing that's going to happen is if you look at the demographics long term, there won't be as many people who apply to college in another 10 15 years. And then there's going to be the big scramble. And my own prediction is that you're going to see, you know, the elite schools will probably do business as usual. Um, the schools that are going to be in peril, and they already are, and you see this in the churches as well, of course, are, are, are the schools that draw a particular clientele, they're tuition driven, they don't have a lot of independent money, and some of them are going to close or amalgamate, right? Uh, certainly theological seminaries are doing this all over the place right now, uh, but so are churches, frankly. So you're going to see this kind, of, uh, this kind of big and small, who can survive, who can't. So, just to be clear, when I say maybe you go local, you could be going to a place that's really in peril, but it could be a place where you could begin to think about, well, what can we do that can persuade at least a few people to keep going, you know? So that may be what you're looking at. I don't know. That's not a great answer, I realize. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brooks. I thought I might hear from you. <laughs> I was sitting at lunch and hearing you talk about your project. I thought, I don't need to do my presentation. I said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Look, this is enlightening. I, I really appreciate the way you frame Baldwin's engagement. Um, and there seemed to be this um, construction of this notion of um, binaries, kind of rejecting binaries, rejecting uh -huh. these word type boxes, but uh -huh. also not being entirely comfortable with notions of integration. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I did the same thing in this kind of faculty administration conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we've erected yeah. this artificial notion of these silos that yeah. never really exist like that, yeah. but yet at the same time, there isn't a comfort with just tearing down the silos. So my question is that in your reading of Baldwin and in your sense of the broader culture, yeah. if neither segregation or separation and or integration are really profitable on the polls, what is this kind of middle way that Baldwin seems to be grasping for and that all of us seem to be trying to grasp for? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, that's a great question that I don't have an absolute answer to. Um, I, I'm, I'm at times comforted, it's a small comfort, by Baldwin's ambivalence about all this. Um, I, 
I do. So I would say this. I think. I think this path that you're asking about, in part, is perspective. So, you know, um, think about this for a minute. I am. I've been resident of the city of Chicago for uh, 30, 37 years. I have to work really hard to find out what the hell is happening in my city. You know, I can listen to NPR locally. But, you know, I go to the Tribune and the Sun-Times and I get these very, you know, miasmic reports. And then I hear about 500 African, you know, 500 mostly African-American people in shock, you know. I have a good friend who works closely with the police in these groups, and I talk to him, and I learn a ton that I think ought to be in a newspaper or something somewhere. So I think part of the problem is perspectival. Um, we, we don't realize the degree to which our location creates blinders, and we need to take those off. And part of what I read Baldwin is saying, and I think Mitchell is too, actually, is it's about the right kind of perspective on how you think about these things. We should not play around with this is a dangerous stuff. That's what Mitchell's really saying. And I think Baldwin is too. This is serious. This is not fun. This can do damage. But it also can be an enormous, uh, enormously powerful and positive thing that's well harnessed. So part of the answer is that. But I also think we ought to get a lot more comfortable with ambiguity than we are now. Um, a literary critical school that does not get a lot of credit these days is New Criticism. Um, and I was taught New Criticism when I was in college, and so I have it's part of my heritage, and I love it. And one of the things the New Critics were very comfortable with was ambiguity. Not because they thought it was an intrinsic good, but because they thought it was the best way to express their circumstances. And I think there's something to that, and I think Baldwin is gesturing to that. So perspective and ambiguity in the problem is for the beginning point. I also think, too, that what Baldwin says is very moving to me, which is, you know, especially if you're privileged, and let's not kid ourselves, everyone in this room is, um, look to the unprivileged for some of your perspective. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Hi. It's, I've not quite figured out the line of this question, so it might the line of your I'm question. Also, I'm afraid you're going to say, I'm not quite figured out the line of what you said. <laughs> I would have more sympathy with it, not. Okay, go ahead. So I'm going to kind of state it first. I think it, I'm thinking about what you're saying about fostering a deliberative culture to yep. adopting different voices. Yep. And the role that literature uh -huh. has to play uh -huh. in that, and the ethics behind adopting those voices. And okay. I'm thinking about it because a few weeks ago, the author of Meet about Kevin, Lionel Shriver, yeah. they were talking in Australia about the imperative the ethical imperative of adopting different voices. Yeah. Recently, Ian McEwen in the UK has been yeah. saying similar things. A lot of the reaction in newspapers in the UK was about how, you know, of course, the caution that needs to be exercised between adopting different voices yeah. and letting that cause trouble and be yeah. troubling and the appropriation of different voices. Yeah. And with presumption. Yeah, and, within, and, and that's, that's a perspective on literature that's getting a lot of airtime at the minute, that literature shouldn't be right. necessarily adopting different voices right. because it's exploitative. And yeah. I wonder if there's therefore a conflict that's going to emerge in the humanities uh -huh. between those who are taking a more, uh -huh. I would want to you know, wrap it up as a kind of post-colonial yeah. approach, but those who would you know, hold to a more rooted and liberal approach, that yeah. there's an ethical obligation to, yeah. to be undone by adopting different Voices. And I think it comes back to what you were asking about this middle way. Is there, do we need to fight, you know, what is literature supposed to do? Is it supposed to undo us by adopting different voices, affirm us by our, through confessional literature? How, you know, what do we do with that? Well, the first thing we do with that is we slightly amend what you said, which I think is wonderful, and say, I wonder if it's going to emerge and recognize that it already has. Okay, so the first thing to say is that's not a bad blueprint for what's going on in the study of religion and in the study of humanity more general is this deep divide over the ethical responsibility of identity um, and whatnot. And my little allusion to your ontological existence is not ossified in time was an attempt to suggest that we all need to be a little bit more bold about that than we tend to be. Um, and you know, I myself think that in the academy at least, the line between, uh, or that there's a tendency to occlude gestures of respect and gestures of condescension. <laughs> um, and I think we all ought to fight that a bit. Um, uh, you know, I um, I mean, I have, I, I'll just talk out of my rap. So I have a certain kind of persona. Part of it is cultivated, I'm sure. Part of it is just the way I am, sort of, you know, the old boy kind of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 
And so, you know, students, and you know, I call students Mr. and Ms. in class and stuff like that. And I have my reasons for doing all that. It's not arbitrary or anything. Um, but uh, I think I probably underestimate the degree to which what I take to be gestures of respect can be perceived as, perceived as gestures of condescension. And I've begun to try to think really hard about that, and I think we all should. So I think the answer is something like this. If it's a really good question, and it's not like I have a solution here, but I guess I would say, you know, there is no more genuine expression of respect than t taking someone's ideas so seriously that you want to use them well. You know? And the idea that, for instance, Cornell West's ideas are off limits to me because he's African American and I'm white is to make axiomatically impoverish my being. And Cornell West certainly doesn't feel the same way about Kant, for example. So I think, I think that one way out of this is to say, no, damn, let's go read these people. Let's make sense of them. Let's presume to interpret them, you know? And I mean, I have to say, you know, I've written on Ellison and Zora Neale Hurston and a little bit on Baldwin, and, and I've been enormously well received by the identity politics community for that. When I gave a paper on Frida Kahlo in a room with 55 women over in Belgium a few years ago, they were thrilled, you know? And so, I mean, my experience of this is that when you make the gesture, people are really happy. But the problem is we don't make the gesture often enough. And so I think we have to be more bold. But we also have to welcome other people into conversations on things that are normally identified with us, you know? And just have to let that happen. Will there be tough moments? Yeah, but consider the alternative. But I think we're there now. I mean, I don't review here, but I don't think that's coming. I think we're there now. There are things that are off limits to some people, and we're on limits to others, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I, there's also a corollary of this is the tendency to assume that a particular student will be interested in a particular thing, right? So, I mean, the table I was at, um, you know, we were talking about a number of things. Uh, happily, I was mostly listening. Appreciate life for that way, especially now. But but you know, it's really interesting. I could feel in my mind, oh, I'm a PhD student in sociology, and I'm thinking you work with Andy Abbott, you're a student in moral education, you must be doing these kinds of things. And some of that is just natural, that's the wiring we have. But we have to pay attention to that wiring, you know, and not let it determine how I hear that project or think about it on the one hand, and on the other hand, not assume that I can't engage it because I'm not a sociologist. You know. So, I mean, I think a few social scientists have written different sentences. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was just for fun. <laughs> and, yes, yeah. Um, so this is a little bit on the uh, periphery of what you've been talking about. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. This is a little bit on the periphery of what you've been talking about. But okay. It might be still relevant enough. Um, one of the, uh, so it seems like when we're trying to address deep divisions in uh, human right. beings, we, we can approach it by saying, let's sit down and talk and really understand each other. And we can approach it by saying, let's uh, <laughs> coerce, um, like through legal reform, perhaps, uh, change in how we do things, and let the disagreement stay in place. Mm -hmm. The people who don't like it can will have to deal with it. Right. Um, and the it, in my own conversations, the ones whom I find most keen on addressing the divisions through asking everybody to sit down and talk are the ones who are most likely to benefit the most from sitting down and talking. Okay. Because they they know that um, uh, they're not likely to be muffled. Okay. Uh, okay. Whereas the folks who are more likely to, uh, to have their ideas dismissed or like generally not heard yeah. seem more keen on having a more powerful force from above come down and say, we're making a change now. Do you have any ideas about how to address that problem? Because obviously it's preferable for us all to sit down and talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it's already skewed, what do we do? Yeah. Um, good question. So two things came to mind, and I, I'm, I, I, I hope they're relevant, and I'm happy to hear if they're not. Um, I don't know if any of you know the cartoonist George Bush. George Booth. <laughs> He's the guy, if you've ever looked at the New York, he has the cartoons with weird looking dogs. You know, anyway, 
he has a he, he likes to draw cave people and he's got these cave people on the horizon and one of them says it is so and everyone else says it is not so no that's stupid blah 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 the next panel is the same same you know horizon the same people and an enormous head is emerging in the background that says it is so and then the last one, it's all the people, and everyone is like, it is so, da da da. And one person says, you goddamn bet it is so. He says it is so, you know. <laughs> so, so I do think you're talking about a real problem. And I think the academy is prey to it in certain very basic ways. I think our media is prey to it in certain very basic ways. And I think it's real, and I think it's great to bring it up. Um, I think satire is a useful tool in these situations. Um, I think Stephen Colbert is part of the solution. Um, so Stephen Colbert has William Crystal on his show, and he sits down with him and he leans over and he says, let's cut to the nub of things. He says, you don't like black people. <laughs> and Crystal looks like, oh, I made a mistake coming here. And he says, well, of course I do. And, and Colbert says, no, 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 you're with friends here. So, you know, the adoption of a persona, I, I think satire is worthwhile. Uh, sending up authorities is a way to say this is what's going on. Now, on the other hand, I think the other way to think about it, though, is whether authorities, and this is where I think the academy, and I think Mitchell's good on this, whether the authorities are actually honoring the values that they are meant to represent by being authoritative in the way you're describing. Right? So, then the question becomes one of calling the presumed authority on standards, arguing with the person. I would argue that a sign of a healthy, deliberative culture is one in which people can argue with the authorities without worrying about the consequences. Okay? Um, I had a conversation at orientation with Mr. Vanderpool about unionization. He came over and talked to me about it. Um, I was delighted that he did. I thought we had a good conversation. Um, it didn't feel to me like he was being particularly abashed about what he said to me or worried about retribution. I think we probably disagree about that. But that's a sign of a healthy, deliberative culture. And it's all his credit, not mine, to be clear. So I think, I think you know, a healthy, deliberative culture is one where people can say, look, you may be the teacher in this class, but I think you're wrong about this, and here's why. And the teacher has to be ready to listen to that and respond to that. An unhealthy culture is when that can't happen, or when it happens only in a kind of pseudo way. I hope I'm right about our conversation, <laughs> but 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 I think but I, I think that's that's a healthy, deliberate culture. But it's a real problem, and I don't think there's an easy solution to it. And I don't want to sound naive about it either. So thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, I guess one, one thing I really liked about one of the Baldwin quotes you have is um, he had this concern for, I guess, his perceived sort of oppressor or enemy that, you know, in some sense he would draw from a tradition, you know, but in a way that, that with, with charity, you know, would be willing to, to sort of undergo some struggle or discomfort in order to sort of correct the person he perceived to be wrong. So he believed there was some sort of shared you know, truth, but not only did he believe that, he cared enough to want to stick around and maybe you know, go the extra mile or have the extra conversation or uh, what have you, right. Um, right. in order to sort of have, I think, charity for you know, someone who wasn't interested in respecting or accepting. And, um, and so I guess politically, perhaps in the university, I mean, one, one of the things you're, you're, I'm interested in is you know, there's a breakdown in civility where we every community draws with the moral limits of their community where the conversation stops now because yeah. you're out of bounds. And that, that has to happen um, because, you know, like, I started on hearing we said before, is, you know, if, if the solution to everything is, oh, let's have our conversation, well, there's a sort of hegemony or there's, there's always a power yeah. uh, at work there. And so, I guess, the question is, you know, how do we, as, a, as an intellectual, a diverse intellectual, or moral, or religious community, draw resources of, of, for a co belief in a common humanistic sort of truth uh, that's generative of charity, but also, I guess, who, you, you, the people you mentioned who might be out of bounds, who, who are the people out of bounds in, in this divinity school community that you think are voices that we need to, out of charity, bring in uh, and, and listen to or want to um, sort of 
want to be a part of a conversation that we might you know, deeply disagree with. Um, well, I mean, my immediate reaction to that is probably taking the safe road of saying that I wouldn't presume to say who feels marginalized and who doesn't. I'm sure people do. Um, so I think a couple things about that, I suppose. These are probably more formulaic answers because I'm a little reluctant to presume on saying more specific. OK. Well, no, it's fine. It's not mine. I don't care. I, you know, I, could, I can be a press secretary. <laughs> um, so, so I think there are innate tensions in a place like this that play into your question that are worth naming. Um, one of them is the tension between students in their first and second years and students farther along, right? And people who really know something and the people who don't know anything. And I, I see that all the time. And even me, and I'm not real good on these things. I can pick up on that. I think the relationship between training for religious leadership and training for scholarship creates kinds of tensions. People, you know, despite our best efforts, and I think we make pretty good efforts, um, there, there is, there is, and I think some institutional things play into this, you know, this kind of ministry program is a little different in some ways, and I think some of the PhD students can play into that. Um, my own view is, at the end of the day, running a church and teaching at an institution are not as different as most people think, but, uh, you know, that's my view. So I think those kinds of things are structural things that play into it. I think the other thing is that there's a perception, and this is where this is where I'm really trying to, this is why I'm trying to move from civic conversation to deliberate culture. There is a perception out there that the word civic discourse is somehow coded or can be appropriated. And I I I've used those in that language a ton, by the way. I'm as guilty as anybody for the public articulation of that around here. But but deliberative culture feels to me more uh, Democrat in some way. You know, our emeritus colleague, Chris Gamble, just published a really wonderful book uh, called Religion for All the People. And the cornerstone of the book is that Jefferson and Lincoln and others who talk about democracy are the best articulators of it because they are insistent on the idea that none of us tends to honor the idea that we should be concerned about all the people. And I think we should be concerned about all of our colleagues, you know. And if if we do not seem to be aware of that, we are somehow impoverishing the deliberative culture, you know. That's not easy, and it's not a checklist thing, but I think something like that has to go into play here. Um, you know, Lady Gilkey, you taught theology for her, here for many years, um, did a great talk on this actual one time. He was a theologian, he got up and he said, well, you know, he said, I hear all these people around here who are worried about the dialogical fields like religion and literature, so my ears perked up, of course. And he said, you know, he said, the truth is, my field theology, if we didn't posit God and religion, we'd be over in the philosophy department in the corner somewhere. So I don't know why everybody thinks theology is more justified here than our religion and literature, which may be happy anyway. <laughs> but, I mean, but I mean, something like that mentality, where what we share in common is, and, and, and this is where I think what Mitchell's trying to do is so important, is this interest in religion, right? And it may be ethics, um, it may be theology, it may be biblical studies, um, uh, let's see here, you know, it may be the AMRS program, you know, but whatever it is, you know, whatever it is, history of Christianity, there ought to be ways to connect because we're interested in religion that in principle make the work other people do of interest to you. It may not change the way you think about anything, and you may not emulate them in any way whatsoever, but you ought to be able to talk to them. If you can't, you should ask yourself why you can't. And be sure that you know that the answer is not that you didn't try. So I think those are the things you're going to do. I'm standing Sorry. up because oh. now we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. And Steve Rosenberg.